Well, thanks very much. I'm going to talk about something uh, completely different, uh, which is which are the economic consequences of the uh, earthquake. Um, and uh, over the years, I've been doing a lot of work on the economics of uh, catastrophes uh, in Japan, in particular. Um, and I want to spend a little time talking about uh, the regional impacts of the catastrophe, um, how the earthquake is going to affect uh, the location of production in Japan. Uh, then turn to some of the aggregate impacts on the Japanese economy. Uh, so I'll spend some time talk comparing this earthquake with um, the Kobe earthquake, or what's known in Japan as the Hanshin Awaji earthquake of 1995. And then and I'll talk a little about uh, the implications for long and short run output for Japan, and then uh, end up uh, talking about some additional uh, risk factors. Um, the start point for thinking about uh, how things affect uh, regional output in Japan, I always feel, is, is looking at Japanese geography. So this is a topological map of Japan. Um, and the red dot shows you where uh, the earthquake uh, occurred. Um, and uh, the uh, outlined cities are the uh, cities with populations of over a million in Japan. Um, and one of the first things that you can see uh, is that cities tend to locate um, uh, very much where there's lots of flatland and where there aren't, um, and where there, the, you have access to the ocean and, and via bays. Um, and this has given rise to, uh, kind of within economics, a notion uh, called locational fundamentals, which is uh, the idea that most economic geography is determined by uh, physical geography. Um, a related uh, point is that uh, bigger bays and more flatland yields bigger cities. And uh, one of the big implications of this is that uh, shocks that don't affect geography don't affect the location of production much in the long run. And uh, unfortunately for Japan, um, Japan has suffered a large number of uh, catastrophic events uh, in its cities. Uh, most um, uh, not, not just uh, uh, most recently, but uh, also um, uh, we've seen in Kobe and then in, in Second World War. Um, and the, the evidence that uh, comes out of these, uh, the analysis of these, these events suggests that cities bounce back. So this is a, um, a graph that shows you uh, the impact of bombing on cities uh, in Japan um, during the Second World War. Uh, so on this axis, we have the growth rate of population in these cities. Um, and uh, on this, uh, uh, this is during the wartime period. Um, and in this uh, axis, we have the growth rate in these cities in the uh, post-war period. The size of the circles indicates the size of the uh, pre-war populations. Um, and what you can see very clearly is that, oops, excuse me, um, just not if I do that. Um, what you can see very clearly is that cities that uh, suffered the most uh, in terms of uh, destruction of their populations during the Second World War, so this is Hiroshima over here with about a 50% decline in its population, Tokyo over there, uh, Nagasaki, etc., um, tended, uh, tended to grow very rapidly in the post-war period. Um, and what that's telling you is that uh, certainly for cities like Hiroshima, where, where, where you actually had to have uh, in-migration in order to affect growth, um, that uh, populations and industries tend to return to the same locations where they were before. Um, that cities are very robust types of uh, economic entities, and um, it's very hard to, to find permanent effects on, on uh, cities uh, from temporary uh, uh, shocks. Um, Kobe, uh, which suffered uh, uh, in the 1995 earthquake, is a case in point. Uh, we see that uh, Kobe's population in 1990, uh, just prior in the census, uh, prior to the uh, earthquake, had 1.48 million. Uh, 1995, after the earthquake, uh, that fell by about 60,000, bounced back five years later to um, 1.49 million, and uh, has hovered around uh, 1.5 million uh, since then. So um, there are a couple of uh, lessons in, in, uh, from this and then a couple of questions. Uh, the basic lesson is that the location of production tends not to be altered by shocks that don't change physical geography, um, but then shocks that change physical geography. And so here you can think about uh, nuclear fallout uh, that might make land uninhabitable, as we saw in, in, in Chernobyl. Um, uh, those types of shocks do have uh, permanent impacts on uh, where people live and what, what is produced. 
So the first question you can ask is, were there shocks that changed uh, Japan physically? Um, and if you think about the, this in terms of uh, Japanese, you know, the, the, the recent events, um, you can think, well, maybe there are two possible types of shocks. One is reassessments of the danger of living near uh, Fukushima's nuclear power plants. Um, and as we've just heard from um, uh, Dr. Brenner, um, you know, those are likely to be relatively um, um, uh, small, at least uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, what impact they're going to have on, on health. Uh, but the other one is land loss, um, and that uh, may be uh, significant in certain areas. And the other is uh, what damage uh, will there be and how long will it take to recover? So um, to give you some sense about um, uh, what is likely, how, what the impact of these uh, shocks are likely to be, I just want to again give you a, a, a satellite photo of, of Japan. Uh, here again, the red is the, uh, the epicenter of the earthquake. Uh, the white dot indicates where uh, the Fukushima reactor uh, reactors were. Um, but if you want to think about this in terms of economic activity, it's better not to look at satellite photos taken at night. It's better to look at satellite photos taken, um, sorry, uh, don't look at the ones at night. Um, don't look at the ones during the day, look at the ones at night. Um, and so this is the same photograph um, taken at, at night. And what uh, you can see in these photographs is that um, the uh, urban areas uh, light up. Uh, so here's Tokyo, uh, Nagoya, uh, Osaka, Kobe in this area. And again, the uh, Kobe shock, uh, the Kobe earthquake was, was right around here. Um, and what you can see is that the, the earthquake occurred in, in a region of Japan that's fairly remote. Uh, not a lot of light, not a lot of economic activity occurring there. And similarly, you can see that the Fukushima plant is located in a region that's largely uh, dark. Um, again, not a lot of light, not a lot of economic activity. So um, both, of, uh, both of those things tend to uh, mitigate the possible impact of this uh, disaster on the uh, Japanese economy. Uh, that said, I want to spend a little time talking about uh, Rikuzen Takata, which is a town that was uh, uh, directly or very extremely close to uh, the epicenter of the quake. Um, this is a NASA photograph of uh, Rikuzen Takata taken on March 1st, 2011. Um, I want you to pay attention to the scale here. This is uh, one kilometer um, over here. So, so this roughly this distance is about one kilometer, about one kilometer here, okay? Um, 13 days later, um, Rikuzen Takata looked like this, okay? So again, this is before. You can see like a beach. You can see lots of land over here, right? Again, it's about one kilometer here. Um, this is what it looked like um, after the earthquake. Um, and you can see that there are large chunks of the town that are simply submerged underwater. Um, probably over 2,000 people uh, died uh, in, this, in this town. It's still not quite clear. Um, up here, uh, you can see this line that wasn't there before. Uh, that's the, um, uh, the debris field uh, that was created as the wave uh, came, came inland. And again, you can see that this is about uh, two, three kilometers uh, inland uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that the tsunami came in. Um, so for, certainly for towns like this, um, we may very well see some permanent effects on uh, their ability uh, to, to rebuild simply because the land has been uh, altered by the, by the quake. Um, and now I want to kind of turn the attention to uh, comparing the Kobe earthquake or the Hanshin quake with the uh, Tohoku earthquake. Um, so I've gotten, I got data um, which is uh, current as of 9 p.m. Um, uh, uh, today, uh, Japan time. Um, if you look at uh, dead and missing, and my guess is that most of the missing at this point in this quake are likely uh, uh, to be, to be uh, dead, one can see that the human toll in this quake was, um, is probably going to be three to four times larger uh, than, the, than the toll of the uh, Hanshin quake. So 23,000 people um, are likely to have, have died. Uh, that number may go up um, uh, somewhat. Um, but a uh, second um, effect uh, of, uh, or second um, impact of the quake was on uh, Japanese uh, capital stock. Um, and here you can see that the, the, the Kobe earthquake uh, hit in, in um, 
um, a, you know, right outside of a very large city of about 1.5 million, uh, Rikuzen and Takata is a city of about 20,000. Um, and the damage uh, to buildings and structures was, was, was awesome. About a quarter of a million houses were either completely or, or partially um, uh, destroyed. Um, compared to um, much fewer houses uh, apparently destroyed in this in this crisis. Um, so again, if you want to think about why it is that so many more people died per house destroyed, again, you think about um, a tsunami wave coming in. Um, there, that tends to both kill the occupants and destroy the house. Whereas here, a lot in in, in Kobe, a lot of people could could escape from their their houses um, when when they were damaged. Um, even the, the estimates of the total number of damaged houses, and again, most of this is occurring not in the three most affected prefectures in Japan, but in places like Ibaraki and, and further inland, uh, the number of damaged houses, so this is not collapsed anymore, this is uh, um, uh, more minor damage, uh, is still much smaller than what we saw in the um, uh, collapsed in the, in, the, in, the, in the Kobe earthquake. In terms of the impacts, um, uh, you know, the, the, the economic output uh, in those regions, um, if you look, compare Hyogo Prefecture uh, with the three um, prefectures that were hit the hardest in this earthquake, uh, so that's um, Miyagi, Iwate, and Fukushima, um, they're roughly the same um, in, in terms of size uh, or in terms of uh, output. If you do a broader estimate, so now throw in um, Ibaragi in... Um, in uh, uh, into this earthquake and throw Osaka into the other one, then it looks a little bit smaller. Um, the electrical out outages in the past earthquake um, were actually uh, substantially larger, at least, uh, at least uh, if you believe the TEPCO estimates. So this is total, uh, this is homes without any uh, electricity. Um, there seem, you know, bl rolling blackouts, of course, are affecting a larger number of, uh, of households. Um, and then we can look at the, the costs. Uh, roughly, this, uh, the, the, uh, the Hanshin earthquake cost about 10 trillion yen, so about 2% uh, um, uh, about, about of Japanese GDP. And the, cost, the government rebuilding costs about uh, 5 trillion yen, um, so that's about 1% of uh, Japanese GDP. So um, we, can, we can get some sense about what the... the uh, what is likely to, to, to evolve over the next uh, uh, several months um, or, or years by, by doing some, uh, asking what happened after the Hanshin quake. quake. Um, and that earthquake, uh, industrial production fell about 2.6% um, in, in, the, in the first month, so this is for all Japan, but then bounced back quite rapidly, um, about 2.2% uh, the next month in February and 1% um, in, in March. So there's a relatively rapid recovery that occurred. A lot of, a lot of disorientation in the first month, uh, followed by um, rapid increases in, in, in economic activity. Um, if we look at the impact on aggregate uh, growth in Japan, um, it's actually uh, surprisingly hard to find an, a, a, uh, an impact on, on aggregate growth. Um, the consensus GDP forecast um, in the first half of January 1995 for the year, for the calendar year, was 1.9% for 1995 and 3.1% in 1996. The actual, um, you know, none of these people knew about the earthquake um, in, a, in advance. The actual GDP growth rates in 95 were 1.9% and 2.6%. Uh, so actually the, the forecast hit the actual growth rate dead on in that year, despite the fact that we had a major um, earthquake in Japan. Um, and this is consistent with a lot of international evidence about the impacts of uh, disasters on GD GDP growth. Um, typically, it's, it's um, often extremely hard to find impacts of disaster casualties on uh, GDP uh, growth rates. Um, what seems to have a bigger impact is destruction of capital stock. Um, and, but even there, in, in, especially when you look at developed countries, as opposed to developing countries, where you actually see much bigger impacts, uh, in developed countries, we see fairly robust economies, and things tend to come back uh, relatively uh, rapidly, um, one, one sees losses of capital stock of around 1% only um, uh, being associated with, 
uh, drops in GDP of around 0.6%. So again, it's a bit of a reassuring um, uh, story. Of course, we don't know the full impact of this of this earthquake, but but uh, the preliminary evidence. Uh, I think suggests that that one should not uh, be worried about a major um, uh, collapse in the Japanese economy as a result of this. So then the next question you may ask is, well, why do you see, tend to observe such small impacts from these uh, catastrophic uh, events? Um, and here the answer tends to uh, be, be related to the trade-off between the negative effect on supply due to the destruction of capital um, so again, this is what, what, what the media uh, has been focused on, which is you know, some factories have shut down um, uh, and uh, there have been uh, breakdowns in supply chains and, and things like that. Uh, so this is reductions in capacity. But uh, what tends to offset that on the, on the other side is a positive effect from demand. Uh, so suddenly in Japan, you've got 120,000 households that have to rebuild or, or repair their homes. Uh, you've got the government that's going to have to step in to um, improve its, its infrastructure, or to repair the infrastructure. And all of that is going to tend to cause GDP growth to rise. On the, on the flip side, you have the, the supply uh, problems. Um, so you can say, well, well, which one do you think is going to dominate? Well, you know, if you'd, if you'd asked me two weeks earlier what was Japan's big problem, I would have said, well, they've got um, uh, underutilized uh, capital. Um, uh, you know, capital utilization rates were around 85%. You had unemployment. You were, you were still recovering from a uh, major financial crisis. You had a lot of, a lot of uh, plant and equipment that was, that was running um, below capacity. Um, so reductions in capacity are likely to have relatively small impacts on the economy when you're not using all of your capacity. On the other hand, um, the low levels of aggregate demand uh, that were also present to the Japanese economy suggest that if you increase demand, that's going to tend to offset the supply side, and that's what tends to, um, uh, tends to re result in relatively small growth, impa uh, growth impacts from these kinds of uh, catastrophes. Now that doesn't mean that wealth hasn't been destroyed, it surely has, but it's telling you something about uh, how GDP is measured and what it means for, um, you, uh, uh, you, uh, 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 for, for aggregate growth. Uh, I want to kind of close by talking a little bit about whether this time is different. Um, got a couple of um, uh, issues. I don't want to talk about radiation because I think uh, our previous speaker has, has talked about that. Uh, we still have some electrical power issues uh, remain for Eastern Japan. Uh, doesn't matter so much for doesn't matter at all for Western Japan. Uh, west of Tokyo is fine. Uh, it's not clear how long that's going to take to re resolve. Um, you know, the, there's concerns about a fiscal crisis in Japan. Japan has a very high net debt level, about 114 percent of Jap of of GDP, um, but uh, the reconstruction costs are likely to be relatively small compared to the net debt. Um, so again, Kobe was around 1% of GDP. You know, even if you think this is double Kobe, um, it's going to be 2% uh, of GDP. Um, it's hard to think that that's going to be the trigger that will, that will cause uh, Japan's fiscal uh, situation to collapse. Um, so just to conclude, uh, catastrophic events tend to have very big short-term impacts, but their long-term impacts tend to be quite small. Um, that, that said, you know, we'll, we'll see over the next month or so um, a lot of stories about parts shortages and um, uh, supply chain disruptions. Um, but um, you know, I think the conclusion is that while, while a human toll is, is truly horrible, you know, fortunately the aggregate economic impacts are likely to be much less severe.